Tara said, say it with your chest or I'll say it for you. Period. What's up, y'all? It's your girl, P. Hope, and I am back with another video. This is Love After Lockup, Life After Lockup, Season 3, Episode 29. And I don't really have much to talk about except for getting right on into it. So, let's start with John and Christiana. So, the scene starts out with John and his homeboy. Y'all remember the older man? And I don't remember if he was actually the one the um the preacher or however you call it in the Indian culture who actually married him and Christiana but I remember that he was like the best man and he was like right there by John's side when they got married so um anyway John goes to talk to him and he pretty much just wanted to confess because shit was just way too heavy on his chest so he wanted to let the friend know all of these lustful and flirty the lustful thoughts and all of this flirting that's been going on between him and tara and the friend was like well i'm gonna need you to get that together because you already know every time you go down this road the shit doesn't pan out right for you and so he hasn't cheated on his wife but in every relationship that he's ever been in, he has definitely cheated. So John has a strong history of not being faithful in his relationships. So the friend just wants him to get his shit together and, you know, do right. John also says that him and Tara have not said two words to each other, but about two words to each other ever since the almost kiss on the back porch last week. And so to keep himself busy, he's just been fixing on this boat because Christiana always wanted a boat. He said his wife wanted a boat, so he purchased the boat and now it's, you know, it's a fixer-upper. So he's back there working on a boat or whatever and then he gets a phone call. It's Christiana. Christiana said that she had some great news, some good news. She said that um, instead of her being home in 30 days, she will be home in the next 48 hours. She'll be home in two days. And not only that, she does not have to go to the halfway house. She can report straight home to John. So, of course, this makes him super excited and he is all here for it. But then she says, well, I also have bad news. Because I am being released straight to your house, one of the stipulations is I cannot be around anybody that has open charges. And unfortunately, my sister Tara has open charges. Okay, now this is where John let us know that he was in a catch-22 because he, I feel like he's willing to bury his lustful feelings and his thoughts for Tara in order to pursue a real chance with his wife, Christiana. But the human side of him is really concerned about Tara's drug use. Because if she can't be in the house with her mom and with John, who has been keeping her sober, then it's no telling what she's liable to do. So, but you know, Christiana feels really bad about it. She said, you know, I feel really bad about it, but you know, these are the rules. And if I want to come home, this is what's got to go on. So John says, you know, don't worry about it. I'll make sure it gets taken care of. Now he also let us know that <laughs> he is very excited about the fact that Whatever him and Tara got going on is not the reason that Tara have to leave. There's a legal reason that Tara has to leave the house. So he's glad that it has nothing to do with him. So then he ends up calling a house meeting with the mom and Tara so that he can pretty much break the news. And so he lets them know about her coming home. And of course, they're like super duper excited. She's like, you know, Tara's like, oh my God, she's coming home. My sister is my best friend. That's my better half. And I'm still side eyeing the fuck out of her because if this is so much 
your best friend, your better ha half, and you know, she look out for you, you look out for her, my sister's keeper type of shit. Why was you coming on to her husband like that? Like, that's still not clicking to me, but whatever. I do believe that she has strong love for Christiana, but at the same time, honey, you just as trifling as they damn come. But anyway, John breaks the news about Tara not being able to stay there once Christiana comes home. Now, of course, this immediately sent both of them into a, a panic, like a small frenzy because the mom, it struck her emotionally because she said, you know, it's like I have to let one child go to let the other one come in. Like, when will I ever be able to have a normal life with my kids? And then, so she breaks down crying and she's asking John, like, is there anything that he can do? Can we get her an extended stay? You know, do you know anybody that she can go stay with? Like, what is going to happen to my child? And John says that he is completely tapped out at this point. He doesn't have the finances to put her up in a room. He doesn't know what she's going to do. But in the next two days, she needs to be gone. And, you know, he said he felt bad about it because he, he's very concerned about her going back out and getting on drugs. And then Tara even said something about it herself. She said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen once I get back out there and get around certain people. Like, you know, it, it's a high possibility that I will go back to doing what I'm used to doing. And so, I mean, hell, I feel like we all see that shit coming because that's going to be a mental blow for her to feel like, you know, you're not good enough to be around here. So, like, we're going to go be this happy family, even though you've been here for the last nine months. But it's like your services are no longer needed. So, goodbye. That's how terror is taking it, even though that's really not the case. So hopefully, you know, this this aired in time for her to see that, you know, Christiana was telling the truth about her having to leave. But I don't know because I haven't done my research to figure out where the hell Tara is and what she got going on. But what she did say was that she does not believe that um, her sister told John that she does not believe that she has to leave because of her charges because her charges were not even um, something she said. I think she said like they never even went through the court system or something like that. It's, um, I guess it's like some type of misdemeanor. But um, she said her charges are not even that serious. She doesn't believe it. She feels like this is just an excuse to get her out the house so that he will not feel guilty about what the hell they've been doing for the past nine months. But she said what she will make sure she does before this is all said and done is she will let her sister know everything that's been going on between her and John. And then we'll see what he think about this. So... You know, at this point, Tara is very upset and she's getting ready to be <laughs> a very vindictive person. So, I don't know how the hell she going to break it down to Christiana about everything they've been doing and still make herself look like she's so damn squeaky clean. But I guess we'll stay tuned and find out. Andrea and Lamar, theirs was um, pretty short this week, short and simple. Um, we are finally on the way for Andrea and Shantae to finally sit down and have some type of resolution. So um, it's Lamar and Andrea and Priscilla. Um, all three of them are in their car and they're headed over to Shantae's house. Once they get there, um, Shantae is the one that opens the door and she greets everybody with a smile and a hello. Um, she let Priscilla come in, she let Andrea come in, and then of course she greeted her dad with a hug. So, um, the, I think Shantae has two kids, I want to say. I don't want to give her three, we're going to leave it at two kids. And one of her children is older than Priscilla and one is younger than Priscilla, but she's still their aunt. So... <laughs> So, um, that little dynamic was cute, but I, I know people who, who have that kind of family dynamic or whatever, but 
um she blended in with those kids like soon as she walked through the door pretty much like the kids weren't shy i mean you know kids kids are innocent so you know they just like shit we got company so let's go play so that's what the kids wanted to do they went out to play and then um shantae lamar and andrea all sit down in the living room on the sofa and Lamar, you can kind of tell that he is feeling really awkward about the situation. He doesn't know where to start. He doesn't know what to say. And um, so he pretty much just gave Andrea the floor. He was like, look, you know, we just here to kind of get a little more understanding about where everything went wrong, especially between you and my wife. And, you know, so I feel like I should just step out of it. I'm going to go step out while you ladies have a conversation. And that's exactly what he did. He took his ass out the door, which only left Andrea and Shantae sitting in the room. And so at first, the ladies are just staring at each other like, I ain't got nothing to say to you. And you don't look like you got much to say to me. Shantae ends up taking the floor. And Shantae says that her stance through this whole situation is that when her dad got out he immediately went to her house with her children and started living this happy life with her and her kids but Shantae and her babies were never included in that dynamic and she just wants to know what was the issue why is it that it wasn't one huge extended family. Why did my dad get out and only deal with you and everything that you got going on? And Andrea's rebuttal was that her children are innocent. She has raised her children a certain way. And, you know, we all know Andrea's kids are sheltered to some degree. So, you know, she was right in saying that her children are innocent because it is a lot that they don't know about. And so she also said that she knew that she was already bringing home an ex-con to her kids. So on top of her doing that, she wasn't sure what Shantae had going on. And her exact words were, I wasn't sure if you were a brat. Now, for me, that was not an excuse because as a grown woman, you can't take a guesstimate on something like that. Now, granted, Shantae is not a little girl. Shantae is not like Priscilla's age. Hell, she ain't even Nyla and Tennyson age. But a child, somebody's child is somebody's child. So you should never just automatically shut the door because of a, what you think it is. You know what I'm saying? I highly doubt at any point if Lamar was ever sitting around bashing his daughter saying, oh, well, you know, my daughter is such a brat. You know, she can really be a whole lot to deal with sometimes. Like, you know, she is a bit extra. I just don't see that from Lamar. I think that you saw bits and pieces of Shantae. I think you made your own assumptions and your own judgments. And from there, you were kind of making Lamar feel like you didn't want Shantae to be a part of what y'all had going on. Like, I honestly believe that. And so, anyway, after they get past, you know, e each other's viewpoints, they said, well, where do we go from here? So, Andrea says that, well, Shantae says that she feels like, you know, she just wants her children because it's almost a little bit too late for her, but she at least wants her children to have the experience that she missed out on. And Andrea completely agreed with it. You know, she said she feels like her and Shantae do need to get to know each other a little more, spend more time with each other. And as far as those, um, as her kids go, she said that she's ready to spoil her grandkids. You know, she, she's excited about being a grandmother. And so she is excited for the process. And it seemed genuine. I mean, it didn't show them getting up and hugging each other or nothing like that. But I do think that the conversation 
conversation was genuine on both ends and I think that both of the ladies were really being honest with each other. So hopefully that was a groundbreaking uh, moment for them and they can start, you know, they can at least start to acknowledge each other more and build from there. But that was pretty much it for um, Andrea and Lamar for this week, y'all. Shin and Lacey. All right, Shane and Lacey, they were short and sweet this week too. But y'all know, Shane been tickling me lately. For the past couple weeks, Shane has really been tickling me and it did not stop this week because Shane was running his ass around there in the house um, changing the locks on the doors. So apparently they live in a smart house. Y'all, I didn't even know anything about a smart house until um, I went over one of my friend's house who recently, you know, she just got her house and it's a um, keyless front door. So, you know, you just stick a, you know, you put your code in and that's how you enter the house. So, child. <laughs> so, it shows Shane standing in the front door changing the code to the front door. And so Lacey just looking around for a minute and then he started talking about, you know, um, adding on extra locks to the windows and he gonna do some shit to the back door. And so, you know, Lacey was like, well, what's all this about? And he was like, you know, I'm just trying to prevent, you know, break-ins in the area and things like that. And she said, well, does this have anything to do with John being out? And he said, why does it matter? And baby, it sent me to the king because it told Lacey everything that she needed to know. Some of that, you really is concerned about this fool coming up in here. But um, they did say that in the past, John has had a habit of breaking into Lacey's shit. So, I mean, I guess Shane is not as crazy as he was looking on that damn camera like and paranoid as it made him look like, you know, this is something that John has done in the past. So he's just taking all precautions to let us know that if somehow and some way this fool end up inside of my house, I have all right to crack this man's skull and that's what I'm going to do. So that's pretty much the message that Shane was putting out. So I didn't feel no type of way about him um, doing all this double, triple, quadruple security to his home. Now, then they go to John. John is on his way to meet up with Lacey's friend Miranda because he needs to know what's up with the what's up. He needs to know is Lacey the one that got him locked up that night because this is just really about to bother him. So they go and meet out on the lake and you know, as soon as they get there, Miranda pretty much let him know like, look, I, you know, <laughs> I really didn't even have to be here, but I just feel like because of the history that me, you and Lacey have, you know, we go way back. So I felt like, you know, I could at least have enough respect for you as a human being to at least come, you know, see what you wanted. And he was like, okay, you know, I can respect that or whatever. He was like, so I, you know, I'll just jump right into it. Is Lacey the one that called the cops on me the night that I was arrested? And she said, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Lacey is the one that called the police on you that night, but at the end of the day, why does it matter? Lacey has moved on and you know, I don't really know if it's my place, but I just think you should know that Lacey's pregnant. And it was at that moment that John's heart got crushed just a little bit. And then John took us down memory lane with him and Lacey and he said that they have been together for a long periodically time. And that on top of that, he had actually impregnated Lacey at one point and she ended up having a miscarriage. And then I think, I wanna say he said she got pregnant a second time after that and something happened to, no. He did not get her pregnant a second time. He thought that the last baby was his baby, but it was not. 
So I don't really know what kind of weird off and on relationship, you know, him and Lacey have, but whatever it is, they are definitely both toxically attracted to each other because I honestly still don't feel like Lacey is done with John. And John definitely already let us know that, you know, it's crushing to hear that, you know, she's pregnant by somebody else. And then he he asked, was it by Shane? She said, yes, it's Shane's baby. And so it definitely, you know, broke him down to know that Lacey was pregnant by Shane. But at the end of the day, he said that he still needs to know what's up with that night that he got incarcerated. So he's still going to get in touch with Lacey and it's not over between them. So baby or no baby, marriage or no marriage, it's not over between John and Lacey is what John wanted to let us know. So I have a feeling we got plenty more seasons of love after lockup to come because these folks just don't know how to quit acting crazy. Like, <laughs> You know, when he told us that he was addicted to Lacey like he is to a drug, he went lying because he didn't care nothing about nothing. Marriage, pregnancy, I haven't, you know, she ain't answering your calls or your text messages. None of that matters to him. He'll be back. All right, this is two weeks in a row that I have not put Brittany and Marcelino at the end. You know, y'all, y'all coming on up on the totem pole now. So Brittany and Marcelino, we are finally ready for this Alaska trip. Everybody is packed and ready to go. Hold on, y'all. I think I got me a little. Yes, I have me a beverage tonight. Y'all know I usually get all choked up. I got me a little water tonight. So anyway, they're ready for this little Alaska trip. And so um, Miss Cindy is excited because it is absolutely beautiful down there in Alaska even though she knows the real reason for the trip. So they get there to their cabin and y'all, the place where um, they're actually staying at, it is gorgeous. The view is beautiful. And she said that, um, Brittany said that it's even more beautiful when it's actually snowing. But, um, you know, just a little bit that we saw, the, the cabin looked nice, the view was gorgeous. And so, you know, everybody's just straight chilling up in the house. And then Brittany pooches her ass down the steps. Mind you, they just pretty much got there. It ain't even been 24 hours yet. And she goes down to her mom and she was like, um, yeah, so I was thinking that we can go ahead and head over to Grandma Jackie's house. And so her mama was looking like, well, I didn't know you had planned on doing this so soon. And she was like, yeah, you know, why wait? I think we need to just go ahead and get this over with. So, of course, Cindy wasn't excited about it, but she, she went with it. So, fast forward, they get over to Miss Jackie's house. And the first people to walk in are Marcelino, Brittany, and the kids. They wanted Miss Cindy to come up last. So, you know, they get up there to, and they talking to Miss Jackie or whatever. Of course, she's happy to see them. She hugs all the um, Britney's kids. She's like, oh, okay, you know, you got all, all my grandbabies with you, whatever, whatever. And she's like, yeah, you see how many babies I got? And she was like, yeah, I, you know, I see them. So, you know, they just sitting there chilling or whatever. And then you have Miss Cindy sneaking up the steps. And then she comes around the um, stairwell where her mom is sitting. And she said, well, hello there. And the mom is in complete shock. She is in complete shock. And she immediately burst out crying. So now Cindy and Jackie are having this huggy, hey. emotional moment. And I'm just like, now see. Britney was on to something. Britney was on to something when she had an idea to come up here and do this. So this could actually be very, very therapeutic for Miss Cindy and for Miss Jackie. So, who child, when they sit down, 
they're talking and you know um miss jackie's rubbing on cindy's face and she's just like wow you know i really thought you guys had wrote me off like i just didn't know like i haven't seen you guys in forever and so then miss cindy was like well yeah that's kind of like the reason that i'm here is because i just wanted to let you know that the choices that you made as a parent have affected the things that I do now as an adult. And, you know, I just wished you would have protected me a lot more than you did. Miss Cindy let us know that, you know, her mom would get high out of her mind. She would get drunk out of her mind. And she even had some cases where her mom's friends would come into the room and do stuff to her. And so all of this stuff has really jacked Miss Cindy's mind up. I mean, like, you know, when you think about a situation like that, how would somebody not have some type of, you know, mental health issues? Like, that's a lot to deal with. And so Miss Jackie lets us know that that's the same shit that she had to put up with as a child. That's all she ever knew growing up because that's how her mom was. And so it's really sad to have that kind of toxic cycle going on because if your great grandmother did it, then your grandmother did it, then your mother did it, and now you as a child, you're doing it. Like, well, Brittany, you know, Brittany has saved herself, of course. She's been clean since she's been home. But Brittany has been down that road to some degree. So, I mean, it's a that's a lot. That's a lot to have to deal with. So, um, you know, of course, at this moment, Miss Cindy is looking for that, you know, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there for you. I'm sorry that I let all of that shitty stuff happen to you. As your mother, I should have had your back and I should have did whatever to protect you. But I was too busy getting drunk. I was too busy getting high. Like those were the things that Miss Cindy went there to hear so that she could just forgive her mom, release all of that shit and start to clean herself up. That's what that was that moment was supposed to be. But Miss Jackie never said none of that. Miss Jackie said well, baby, all of the stuff that happened to you as far as you running away all the time, I never made you run away. As far as you doing drugs, I never shoved no crack pipe in your mouth. And, and as far as my friends doing whatever they was doing to you, you should have came to me and told me that. And I would have made them stop. That's all the hell Miss Jackie had for her. And I was Miss Cindy in that moment. She got up and she excused herself and she was ready to go. And I would have been ready to go too. And Brittany said that at that moment she was sitting there fuming mad and she wanted to knock Miss Jackie ass backwards down them steps. And I would have helped her. I would have helped her because, I mean, you are in, in such an old and fragile stage as it is. Like... What is it for you to say, I'm sorry? What is it for you to say, you know what? I was a fucked up person. I wasn't fucked up on purpose. It happened to me. And I was under the influence of things that I didn't really have control over. So, you know, for you to experience all these things that you experienced, I'm sorry. Miss Jackie didn't think about none of that shit. And it kind of just, the scene kind of ended right there with um, Miss Cindy outside and saying that she didn't want to do this shit no more. So, I'm sure we'll pick back up on that next week. But, baby, Miss Jackie got me and everybody um, up there in Alaska fucked up. Because, how dare you? Like, Miss Jackie got a lot of balls. And so, I can see why she said, oh, you know, I thought y'all had wrote me off. I thought everybody, you know, had just stopped fucking with me. Well, yeah, it, even if we was ready to give your ass another chance, you just sealed your deal. You just you just put the nails in the coffin with this dumb ass shit that you did. So I'm very curious to see how this um, conversation is going to um, end next week. And I think that while they're down there in Alaska, Brittany said they're also going to see Miss Cindy's dad and her baby daddy. So, whew. 
if Miss Jackie was just the first stop, then child, listen, Miss Cindy, if you come back to Vegas and you just start smoking crack, I ain't even gonna be mad at you because your first stop has just been a lot. And I really do feel bad for you, but y'all, that was Brittany and Marcelino. <laughs> Chevelle and Quaylen. <laughs> All right, y'all. Chevelle and Quaylen. So, <laughs> we're picking up where we left off with them. So, Chevelle is twisting her wide shoulder as over to my boo, D-Mark, and asking him if he will please watch Myla and go ride some rides with her so that she can have a little alone time with Quaylen. Because, remember... D-Mark said he was tired of looking at uh, Quaylen's little dried up looking ass. He was over it. And so, um, he's going to go spend time with little Myla while Quavo and Chevelle do what they do. So, they finally get there a long time. She says that she wants to go on the Ferris wheel because, you know, this will give them an opportunity to sit down, be in a little secluded area, and have a conversation. So, as soon as they get on the damn Ferris wheel, Chevelle starts speaking her speech. She like, look, you know, I'm not going to be around here playing with you. You think it's going to be that easy to just get me back? Well, it's not. If you're not talking about being committed to me, then you ain't talking about nothing. And as soon as you get off this Ferris wheel, you can really just go fly a damn kite. And so, from that point, uh, Quavo was like, committed you want me to be committed to you she was like yes and you know I'm what kind of commitment I'm talking about I ain't talking about just you know you gonna stay down with me I'm talking about being committed for real for real and he was like oh okay so you mean committed like this then my boy Quavo whips out a damn box and then he cracked the box open and it was a ring up in there and he said, yeah, you been committed like this? Oh, okay, that's the fuck I thought. And I'm like, I don't know if this is romance. I don't know if I should be happy at this moment or, you know, if she should abort the damn Ferris wheel because, you know, it was getting a little, a little hot and heated between, you know, the, the word commitment. So anyway, he done pulled out the ring and he looked over at her. He's still sitting in his chair and he said, yeah, committed. So, will you marry me? And then he got down on his one knee and he repeated himself. But he switched up the words after he got on his knee. Because he repeated himself about four different times. But it was, would you marry me? It wasn't, will you marry me? He said, would you marry me? Like, four damn times. And she was just sitting there stuck on stupid for just a second. Because you could see every last tooth in that bitch mouth. And then she just said, yes. Yes, I will marry you. And I was looking like... Then I had turned back into D-Mark because I'm like, you just had so much pressure and so much energy for this man a while ago. But then he pull out a ring and the world is right. All right. <laughs> hey, I guess. So then he sit his ass back up in the chair on the Ferris wheel and, you know, she grabbed hold to him and she just started crying like a damn baby, y'all. And he was like, it's okay, baby, you know what I'm saying? Quit crying, you know what I'm saying? It's us. You have been there with me, and I told you. I've been telling you from day one that you saved my life. Like, man, I owe you that. I, that's all you right there. I owe you that. And I'm like, man, this is some real ghetto love right here. This is, <laughs> this is some real ghetto shit. But they loved the moment. Um, Quaylen got the reaction that he wanted. Chevelle is feeling like she's on top of the world. She's flashing her ring. She's ready to, you know, blind a nigga with her, um, I'm finna, I'm not finna go there with the damn, um, CZs, but I'm, 
I'm not saying, but I am saying that I have some similar looking costume jewelry in my bathroom right now. That's all I'm saying. But anyway, Quaylen is feeling cockier than ever at this point. He said, you know what I'm saying? I can't wait to go down here and put this shit in d Mark face. You know what I'm saying? So he can shut the fuck up. And I'm just like, okay. So now we know what is about to transpire with this whole blow up down in Branson. It's about to be d Mark versus Quavo. Who y'all got y'all money on? That's what I wanna know. Drop down in the comment section below and let me know who y'all got y'all money on. Is it my boo? Now, I do agree with y'all. All of y'all that's been saying that D-Mark is acting like a fucking scorned ass ex-lover or something or acting like, you know what I'm saying? He was trying to slide in on Chevelle and then here come Quavo cock blocking this shit. I do, I do agree with y'all because he is acting like that. He's acting like he's doing more than his cousin duties. Let me say that. But I want to know if that's the case and if these two going to jump in the ring and get the god dang throwing them balls next week, who y'all got y'all money on? I ain't going to tell y'all who I got my money on, but... I will tell y'all if it's right or wrong when that clip finally do happen. So I want to know, put D-Mark and then put the boxing glove or put Quaylen and put the Glock boxing glove. Let me know who y'all got y'all money on for the fight. And that was it for Chevelle and Quaylen. And now let's go on to our last couple of the night. Woo, y'all. Last on the list ended up being... Lindsay and Scott because at this point I think we are all over this couple and I think and I'm hoping that this was the finale for them and we don't have to see them anymore because at this point they tired like Lindsay is super tired Scott you've been a fool from day one so I mean y'all can go at this point y'all can go the door in my zone voice okay um so, their scene starts with Scott telling us that, you know, he just is in disbelief in the fact that he fell in love and he had no idea that she was a psycho. Okay, big deal. Because my thing with that is, Scott, I do agree with Lindsay to a certain degree. You had shit of your own that was going on. You admitted that on camera. Uh, you know what I'm saying? She called them prostitutes. You call them escorts. But either way, for her to find out that information, I do believe that the rest of that stuff that she found about you not having no money and all of that other shit, I do believe that that is true. Because if you really had money like that, when it was um time for you to just really put your rollerblades on and get everything done for Miley Grace, you would have caught that damn black lady back from episode one that you had come over there, the interior decorator. You know, we never saw that bitch again. So, you know, if you had so much money, you could have had somebody been come in and got all that stuff done because at that point, it was not that rocky between you and her. So I do believe your finances are jacked up. Um, and I do believe that, you know, you was doing what you was doing. You was paying for the poom poom. Wow. Like, it, it is what it is. But, you know, you said that you can't believe you fell in love with a psycho. Well, you know, we can. We can. And y'all remember he was telling us that he let Lindsay tell that room, tell that office, do what she wanted to do because, you know, he knew at some point that she was going to end up self-destructing and, you know what I'm saying, causing her own self-harm. And that's exactly what she did. So he said two weeks later, she was in a rental car. Now, I'm sorry, this is not him telling the story. This is her telling the story from behind bars. She's talking to us from the other side of the glass. She said that two weeks after she tore up Scott's office, she was going to get a rental car. She had a rental car, and the rental car, she ended up getting pulled over by the U.S. Marshals, and that rental car had drugs in it. Now... 
I know that it's a pandemic and I know that it's trying times around here. But you mean to tell me that you just happen to be driving the one rental car that somebody left drugs in. That's what you want me to believe. Huh? Cause I wait. My battery pack is 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 charged. I got plenty of memory on this SD card. So you really looking at me and telling me that the one rental car that you picked out just so happened to have some drugs in it. <laughs> So, for these charges that she has accumulated at this point, she is looking at an additional five years for that fool la la that she did in my um, Gardini voice. And then, uh, you know, I guess they asked her, like, you know, what's going on with Miley Grace? And so, Miley Grace will be going back to, you know, stay with her mom or whatever. I know the mama like, well, damn, that little break was short-lived, but, you know, whatever. But she wanted to give a message to Miley Grace, and she said that she apologizes to Miley Grace and that, you know, they'll get over this just like they've done in the past and everything will be all right. Lindsay, I hope for the sake of Miley Grace that you will do one or two things. You will either find a way to exit your daughter's life and be honest, have an open and honest conversation with her and just let her know that it's too late for you. You're unfixable or until you really fix your shit from the inside out that you don't need to be in her life right now. Because at this point, if you're the type of role model that's in your daughter's life, like you're setting her up for failure and i feel so bad for miley grace i really do because you know when she talks to you she holds on to your every word them little couple of weeks that you was home she was so excited to come and live with you and this is the kind of shit that will send a preteen down the wrong road at a very early age and this is how um, repetitive cycles start because of people like you, Lindsay. So you either need to be adult enough to step out of your daughter's life right now or get your shit together. So figure out which one you want to do. I'm not going to turn to, um, you know, I'm not going to turn into Iyanla Van Zant right now because, you know, you really about to piss me off. So I'm just going to go ahead and end this little review. But yeah, that was it for um Lizzie and Scott. Goodbye, good riddance. Okay, get your shit together. So yeah, y'all, that was season three, episode twenty nine. Love at the lockup, life at the lockup. If you enjoyed this review, please do not leave without hitting that thumbs up button. It is very important to me. And also, make sure you hit that subscribe button and join the family. I would love to have you. I'm not going to do nothing but go ahead and start my next video. Y'all, I got a lot of content coming out here really soon. So, you know, this is a great time to subscribe because, you know, your girl is on a roll. I'm putting these videos out, point blank, period. So, um, that's it. I want you to be happy, be healthy, be safe. It's your girl, P-Hope, and I will catch you in the next video.